Hi, I'm Alan Shavitz, webmaster from RIN Coalition. Before we get started on this program, I'd like to go over a few items. This is a Zoom webinar, not a Zoom meeting. If you're not familiar with the webinar format, it's basically as if you are an audience in an auditorium. Your video and audio are not on. Uh, however, you will have the opportunity to ask questions at any time during this program by using the Q&A icon on your screen. Just click on that icon, enter your question, and it will be dealt with during the Q&A period of this session. You also have the option to turn on or off closed captioning if you have a need for it. There's an icon at the bottom of your screen, mark CC. I should point out these two features may not be available to you if you're on a small screen, such as an iPad or smart pad or smartphone. This program is being recorded, and the recording will be available on the Marin Coalition website within a day or two of the end of this program. And now, without further ado, I present to you your host, Scott Pinsky. Good afternoon and welcome, everyone. Sorry for a couple minutes delay in getting started, but glad you're all here. Uh, we are here to discuss uh, the California housing element process, and we have a very interesting program ready for you uh, on how those element requirements impact local governmental entities here in Marin County. I'm Scott Pinsky, the chair of the Marin Coalition. For those who are uh, unfamiliar with us, we are a uh, all volunteer nonprofit uh, public affairs forum here in Marin County. We present public affairs programs on issues uh, and conversations that truly matter. And we continue to make our programs available to the public through Zoom at no cost. Uh, we rely on audience donations and support to keep our operation going. And we invite you, if you would uh, consider supporting us to go to our website, marincoalition.org and make your contribution. Uh, before we begin, and I'm not going to do a long introduction here, um, I just want to tell you about the next uh, program, which is December 14 at noon. We will be having uh, Supervisor Stephanie Moulton Peters, who will be presenting for us for the first time, and we look forward to hearing that. Today's program, every eight years, local entities here in Marin County, including the state, I'm sorry, including uh, the county itself, are required by the state of California to prepare and submit uh, for state approval a housing element, which is designed to achieve the goals that are outlined in state legislation. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. We're gonna to hear from three officials from local governments that are in the process of doing that. Uh, we'll hear from Adam Wolf from Court of Madeira, Patrick Kelly from Mill Valley, and I hope I pronounced this correctly, Alicia. Alicia Guidice, or Guidis, I'm sorry, I didn't get that down. Uh, from the city of San Rafael. And our, our presentation will, will be moderated by Bob Pendoli of the Marin Environmental Housing Co Collaborative. Uh, before I introduce Bob and let him take it away, I just wanna mention that the program is really about a very specific narrow uh, aspect of the uh, housing universe of issues. This is about the housing element process uh, and how local entities comply with state requirements relating to those requirements and the state imposed minimum housing goals. Uh, other matters that relate to uh, the state mandated objectives and local control or uh, how those local housing needs are identified by uh, the area uh, entities that create the RENA minimums, those are not really uh, the topic today, and uh, we hope to deal with those specific issues in future programs, but today's program is really just focused on how the housing elements are generated and uh, the process through which these cities are complying with state law. So let me now introduce Bob, who's going to host our program. Bob Pandoli is the board chair for the Marin Environmental Housing Collaborative. He's a former member of the Marin Workforce Housing Trust, and the Board of Directors for Fair Housing of Marin. He has 40 years of experience in public sector planning, having been the Director of the Environmental Management for Solano County and the Planning Director for the City of San Rafael and the Town of Cordendera. He also served as Interim Planning Director for the Town of Fairfax and for the City of Sausalito. Bob has a Master's Degree in City Planning from California State University of San Diego and currently lives in San Rafael. 
So without further ado, let me turn it over to Bob. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Scott. Um, and let me see if I can beam up my presentation here. Uh oh, glitch. Here we share the screen. Okay. Um, well, this is going to be a very brief summary presentation of uh, the re state's requirements for housing elements. And I'm going to talk about this in terms of cities, but um, the housing element requirement applies to um, towns and counties in exactly the same way as it does the cities. But for the sake of brevity, I'll just talk about it in terms of cities. Um, probably most people know that um, every city in California is required to have a general plan. Um, it's kind of the constitution for development of the community. Um, the state law divides the general plan into elements or chapters, for example, um, every general plan is required to have a circulation element, and obviously that talks about how we get around. Um, also, uh, the general plan must have a land use element um, that kind of direct, directs the overall land use management program of the city, such as uh, the subdivision process and zoning. Um, the law um, requires that every city have a housing element. Um, and this is basically uh, describes how the city is going to um, meet its housing needs. Um, the housing element is different from the rest of the general plan in that it has to be approved by the state. Um, what that means is that every eight years, um, the city is required to draft a housing element. It sends the draft housing element to the State Department of Housing and Community Development, and they will issue uh, a set of comments um, and ultimately um, certify that the state, that the general, that the housing element, excuse me, um, complies with general plan law. There are really serious ramifications for cities that don't have a certified housing element. Um, they um, are subject to, may be subject to legal, legal action. Um, a court may determine that the city is no longer eligible to issue um, building permits. Um, until it gets its general plan certified um, and may not be eligible uh, for certain types of revenues. Um, and the housing element is updated every eight years. Uh, right now, um, all of us in the Bay Area are in the sixth cycle. Um, the term we hear about the most often when we discuss um, uh, the housing element is RENA, the Regional Housing Needs Allocation. Um, and what this is about is that at the beginning of the cycle, the state of California decides um, how many housing units the region needs to plan for. In other words, how many units does uh, the Bay Area have to plan for? And then the local uh, regional council of governments, in our case, the Association of Bay Area Governments, ABAGS, um, distributes that need um, amongst the um, counties and the cities. And that allocation is called the Regional Housing Needs Allocation, or RENA. Um, so what's the basic purpose of the housing element? Well, um, it analyzes the community's housing needs at, at all income levels. Um, and most important, it provides strategies to meet the identified housing needs, including RENA. Now, housing needs, in addition to just basic production, uh, go to other issues such as um, housing types, uh, single family versus apartments, for example, uh, low density, medium density, high density housing needs, um, and um, the need for housing preservation. Um, there are, well, the cities have great discretion in terms of how they organize um, their housing element. Um, there's basically um, seven dish different factors in the organization. Uh, first, it begins with um, a background report. That's a general introduction that explains something about the community, um, explain what, explains what the state's requirements are uh, for a housing element, and so on. Um, more substantive is the housing needs assessment. Um, the the um, city um, has to do a really in-depth um, assessment of its needs. In addition to 
um, um, acknowledging the RENA, um, it has to look at the needs of um, various income groups. Um, what are the, um, how many, are, are low and moderate income households overpaying for housing? Is that is, are they paying more than 30% um, of their income for housing? Um, is um, housing fairly located? Um, what are the housing, what are the needs for preservation? Um, what do, are we meeting the, are we providing um, housing for our workforce or do we in fact have a big workforce that has to commute into the community uh, because um, we aren't meeting that particular need? Uh, the uh, element also does a constraints analysis. Um, it looks at a full range of constraints. Um, obviously, it looks at um, how much vacant land is available. Um, it also looks at um, the cost of land. Um, the city must analyze its own regulations to determine to what extent uh, the zoning ordinance or the subdivision ordinance are constraining development. Um, and then it looks at um, factors that um, are outside the community. Uh, such as um, regional or countywide services. Um, and in our case, um, Marin County, we're certainly looking at um, water as a potential constraint. The most, the most substantial part of the um, housing element is what's called the housing plan. Um, it provides goals, policies, and programs uh, to um, meet the needs that were identified in the assessment uh, to overcome the constraints. Uh, that were uh, found in that part of the analysis. Um, and the programs are very specific. Um, the programs um, provide um, you know, specific steps that are gonna be taken. Um, it tells you who in the organization will be responsible for implementing the program. Um, and there will be timelines and there will usually be um, specific um, benchmarks uh, to measure success. Uh, one of the uh, frequently controversial parts of the housing element is um, an inventory of sites. Um, in, in preparing the um, housing element, the planners um, have to identify um, an adequate number, an adequate supply of sites to support the arena, um, enough sites to um, actually build the housing that the regional housing needs analysis uh, or allocation calls for. Um, this inventory is very specific. It lists specific sites by assessor parcel numbers. There will be maps showing exactly where those are. Uh, the existing zoning on the sites uh, will be identified and the potential um, yield um, on those sites will also be listed. Um, and many cities in their inventory will also um, list um, new zoning that's proposed for a given site. So for example, uh, you may have a vacant parcel in the neighborhood of an acre or so that's zoned for single family, um, but the inventory of sites may recommend that it be uh, rezoned for multifamily housing. Um, a new requirement um, in, the house, in the housing element law is a requirement to have policies that are affirmatively further fair housing. Uh, what this requires the city to do is to analyze um, inequities um, in housing um, in the community, for example, um, do we have um, segregation? Um, uh, are, um, it, if, uh, do we have um, an adequate range of opportunities uh, for all groups in the community? Um, and what are policies to correct any inequities um, that might be found? Um, and finally, um, the housing element must include a really robust public outreach project. Um, and we're certainly seeing that in Marin. Um, each community is going through an extensive um, public hearing process. But over the past five years, the legislature and the governor have, have recognized that we are in fact in a housing crisis. Um, 80, more than 80 um, housing laws have been passed in the five year, past five years. Um, some of them that we hear about are the Housing Accountability Act, um, which um, defines, uh, more clearly defines the city's responsibility um, and actually the rights of applicants. Um, the Permit Streamlining Act um, limits the amount of time 
that uh, the city can take to review and make a decision on um, housing development applications. Um, in certain cases, the law says that um, certain types of housing, um, including certain types of affordable housing, um, have um, are eligible for a by right approval process. Um, what this means is the project can um, must be approved um, without public hearings in a process that's not much different from the building permit. Uh, very different from what we've seen in the past. Um, the law also requires in certain cases that objective standards um, have to be used to evaluate um, a housing application. Um, I, in, in my past, um, I'm used to standards that said that new housing must be consistent with neighborhood character. And when you think about it, that's not objective at all. How do you measure neighborhood character? Um, and what this means is that uh, today, um, cities must have measurable standards uh, that they can use to evaluate um, compliance with um, goals and policies and the housing element and to make um, decisions on whether um, to approve a given housing application. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, a new part of the housing element is a requirement for to affirmatively for further fair housing. Um, and that's um, that's been a result of recent legislation. Um, overall, the requirements for the housing element have become uh, much more uh, detailed and specific than in previous cycles. Uh, but maybe the biggest change is that RENA is now on steroids. For example, um, in the past cycle that began in 2015, uh, the city of Belvedere was responsible to plan for 16 units. In this cycle, um, they have to plan for 160. Um, San Rafael, um, back in 2015, had arena allocation of just about 1,000 units. Um, today, they're responsible for planning uh, for over 3,200. Um, in 2015, the total allocation to the county and all of the cities and towns here in Marin was about 2,300 units. Uh, today, it's over 14,000. Uh, so uh, the arena um, and the housing element have become a really tall order compared to previous cycles. Um, kind of a final message to the audience. Um, you can find your uh, community's housing element online. Uh, just type in, for example, um, San Rafael housing element, um, and you'll be you know, on Google, and you'll be taken to a site um, that will, where the housing element will be available for you to look at. Um, you should uh, write your supervisor and council members with your comments um, and um, look for opportunities to speak up at public hearings. Uh, with that, uh, Scott, I think I'm done and ready to move on. Very good. Okay. Uh, so, Bob, you're going to take it from here, I believe, and introduce uh, Adam from Corte Madera, and then we'll hear from him, uh, followed by Patrick and Alicia, and then we'll do a, a panel discussion once the, uh, the three presentations have been completed. So uh, thanks, Scott. Um... Well, um, I'm pleased to introduce Adam Wolf. Um, he's been the Director of Planning and Building for Corte Madeira uh, since 2014. Um, and right now he's also the um, Acting City Manager. Um, prior to joining the um, Corte Madeira, um, Adam spent almost 15 years in New York City where he obtained a master's in planning from uh, Columbia University and he began his career as a planner. Um, he eventually served as deputy director of New York City's Manhattan office at the Department of City Planning. Um, Adam grew up in Mill Valley and is a graduate of Tam High. Um, he currently lives in Petaluma with his wife, Alicia, and three sons. Um, Adam, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Bob, for that introduction and for um, that great intro to the housing element process. I'm going to try to get into it. I think we've, um, I'm going to get my, share my screen here, um, just so I can get that up. Uh, let's see if I can do this, share my screen. Hopefully you all can see that. Nice to get some confirmation there. Um, 
Good. So, okay, thanks. Um, so yeah, I, I obviously, as Bob just uh, went through, uh, the housing element uh, is a large uh, document with a lot of analysis and programs and policies stating sort of the housing goals for each of our communities. Um, we've been tasked here, I think, with trying to provide a little bit of an insider look at how we go about uh, addressing these state laws, which we're all subject to. Uh, specifically RENA, and uh, discuss some of the challenges of implementing these these housing plans and, and then also provide an update on where we are in our processes. So going to try to do that all in, I think, a, a lim limited amount of time. Uh, obviously, can't go through the entire housing plan in that am amount of time. Our, I think our document's something like 500 pages or something. So, or if not more, um, but I thought I would actually just focus more on, I think what Bob highlighted, really the the, the site inventory um, process and, and our strategy for addressing how the town of Corte Madera is going to actually uh, try to plan for uh, such a substantial number of housing units. Um, and let's see if I can go. And, and as Bob mentioned, I think this was already um, described well, but um, you know we're looking at a, a thousand percent increase from 2015 to 2023. 20, Again, these are the eight-year um, cycles of the housing element. So for the next, uh, essentially the next decade, looking at trying to to plan for 725 units. Again, at all different income levels, um, and I won't go into that. Um, I will say we, you know, when we got those numbers, I think a lot of cities um, in Marin, uh, Corte Madera is one, we were, um, did, were authorized to actually, we appealed those RENA numbers um, at the Association of Bay Area Governments, um, given the high number, but like every other city, um, we were rejected or our appeal was rejected. Um, and so having said that, we quickly, I think, pivoted and really wanted to start a discussion about housing in uh, the town, uh, talk about housing needs and get different perspectives on, on, um, on, on what really the town's goals should be around housing policy. Um, as we know, housing has become a, a very significant issue, cost of living, um, it's, it's critical for our employers, um, critical issue for employers. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of services, obviously, that are provided to the town. Um, affordable housing becomes a very significant issue that we um, are, need to address. And so we wanted to start really focus on a, a program of just having a conversation with um, uh, the Corte Madera community. And so really, we started a six-part workshop series back in October of 2021, went through March of 2022, where... Uh, the initial conversations, both in November, December, started just having instead of staff talking to folks, we we wanted to bring in people from our community and get their, you know, have their perspectives about housing policy and what the town should be doing and thinking about out there and and, and discussed amongst our community members. So we brought in our local superintendent of schools of the Larkspur uh, Corte Madera School District. Um, water manager from Rim Municipal Water District, uh, our president of uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, affordable housing developers, all to just have a discussion and a panel discussion around housing in, in Corte Madera. Um, in December, we actually brought in uh, property, local property owners, some who had been discussing redevelopment of their properties, um, uh, sort of under the radar in the past, uh, five years or so with the town, um, but we're considering housing as a potential option on their properties. And so we had them uh, describe why they thought uh, housing could be a, a good use of their property and work well with potentially some of the other uh, commercial uses um, that they uh, either managed or uh, currently um, own. And slowly and methodically, I think through this six part workshop series, I'm, I'm sort of focusing on this because I think it was really uh, core to our ability to have a, a, a sort of a, a good 
um, positive discussion around the housing element rather than focusing on 700 the, the mandates and the state laws really just trying to think about how we could uh, how we could think about housing as an opportunity to improve um, our town and uh, through uh, January February March we started to develop a uh, framework for housing opportunity sites in Corte Madera and this was sort of the core um, uh, criteria that we used in order to um, start to look at where we should locate potential new housing development, or at least facilitate housing development uh, in Corte Madera. And a lot of these things may look familiar, but um, you know we know traffic is a concern. So, so try to locate sites uh, close to the highway and, and best public transit, um, try to, locate new sites for housing away from established uh, residential neighborhoods. Um, think about how we get a win-win with aging properties. I mean, we've had a, a vacant movie theater, as many of you know, uh, adjacent to the highway for many years now. Um, how can we facilitate and maybe um, uh, uh, incentivize actually some movement there by allowing more residential uh, capacity at a site like that? Um, look towards the future in terms of what's going on with shopping centers and um, you know some of our uh, retail establishments and I'll just say you know Macy's is, was a big one is is uh, uh, trans making you know there's a transition nationwide from a lot of their physical stores and and there's an opportunity there to really reimagine what uh, could happen um, at the village shopping center if, if Macy's was to be redeveloped. Uh, and then try to be as consistent as possible with with our current land use policy in town where housing, as Bob knows, housing uh, through the 2009 general plan, housing has really a lot of many of our sites. So what that ended up, where we ended up um, looking, you could see a lot of our sites and we we're fortunate in this regard. We have a lot of commercial sites adjacent to the highway and, and tr public transit, relatively large sites that could be uh, good multifamily housing sites. And we developed essentially a map and started to uh, think about relative size and scale of uh, buildings or density multifamily housing on these sites, uh, yellow being sort of the lower density closer to existing single family homes, more of a medium density uh, in the orange, and then the highest density or what we're calling core at the Macy site. And that was sort of our strategy to, to ultimately um, come up with how we're going to actually create or facilitate, uh, create the zoning to facilitate um, uh, and plan for housing in Corte Madera uh, beyond the 725 units that the state mandated. Um, that is, uh, we, we also, of course, in Marin, uh, scale and size is, is, a, is, is very important. And so we wanted to show um, what that size, uh, what that density looked like. Um, we have examples in Corte Madera um, of, of basically three stories or four story buildings that are of this 30 to 35 dwelling units an acre. Um, so we wanted to test and see, uh, make sure that um, people understood essentially what size buildings we were talking about. We did some site testing through some modeling to help um, help uh, graphically show what potentially some of these sites, uh, what we're looking at and, and make sure that the number of units we were saying could be built on these sites actually could fit within a scale or size of building that was familiar with um, our community and, and residents in our community. Um, ultimately, you can see this is through that process, we almost reverse engineered it. You know, Let's talk about form, proper sites for housing, and then we came back to um, our rezoning proposals. We're gonna have to change the zoning in order to actually uh, meet the RENA requirements, uh, get enough potential units on each of these sites to ultimately add up to um, the RENA and the state mandates. Um, and so this is just a table showing what we ended up doing um, and what we've uh, proposed. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, existing density units per acre on the left-hand column for all of these sites, and then we're showing what we're rezoning those sites to. Um, and you can see the bulk, our strategy, really the bulk of the units we see as a, the, the biggest opportunity, which again then allows us to 
not increase density elsewhere is to locate the vast majority of the, of, well, I shouldn't say the vast majority, a significant, significant number of units at the village. Um, I just have this slide. We've done, you know, community outreach and just really being out and discussing this openly and um, transparently with community members, um, listening to people and their concerns has been a huge part of our process. Um, and so this just shows July and August, we, we've been out at 4th of July events, our, our farmers markets and whatnot, just talking to people about their concerns and what they thought of our plan and strategy to uh, plan for the number of units. And so that's been a success. Um, a lot of feedback that we've received, um, general support concerns uh, about traffic, sea level rise and water resources. Those were the, the major concerns that we heard from our residents. But, you know, understanding the state requirements, there weren't other real concrete strategies proposed for where else to put this housing or how to um, better plan for the housing in our community. Adam, um, this would be great. <laughs> are we, are we, uh, do I have one more minute just to That'd be great. This? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll wrap up. I think about 10 minutes right here. So just in terms of, and we can get into this a little bit later. Um, you know, there are one of the things that I think about in terms of implementing this, what are the challenges? Well, one, we don't control the land. So there are additional factors uh, that you have to have willing property owners and economic forces to actually build housing. Um, the other thing that causes, I think, us planners some heartache is, is we can talk about scale and size of buildings all we want, but the state has other laws in place that when a developer comes and builds something, we don't control all the um, standards and, and essentially bigger buildings can be built than what we're actually showing um, we think is the appropriate size. Um, and then obviously we do need long-term commitments and resources uh, for comprehensive planning that aren't always in the, within our agencies. Um, to finally, sl final slide, this is where we are with in our process. We've basically have uh, developed a draft um, housing element HCD review is it, we just had our we'll get our comment letter actually from HCD on Monday and then we'll we'll move on from there so thanks very much um, this is our last slide on our website where you can find more information and I'll stop there uh, thank you Adam that was really terrific um, I gotta say um, over the past year driving through Quarter Madeira from time to time I was so impressed to see big signs saying, uh, come and participate in the housing element. Uh, really innovative approach. Um, okay, next, our next speaker is Patrick Kelly. Uh, Patrick joined uh, the city of Mill Valley in 2018 as director of planning and building. Um, he manages um, planning, building, and enforcement services. Um, he's been involved in community development for over 35 years, uh, worked as planning manager for the city of uh, Modesto, and before that was a senior planner for the city of Ontario. Uh, Patrick has a Bachelor of Science degree in Urban and Regional Planning from um, Cal Poly Pomona and a Master's in Public Administration from California State University, Northridge. Um, Patrick, take it away. Thank you so much, Bob, and uh, thank you to the Marin Coalition for inviting me to participate in today's discussion. I really appreciate the opportunity, and let me just share a screen so we can get started. Let's see, can you all uh, see our housing element page? Looks good. We good? Looks yep. great. Very good. So uh, just uh, by way of a little background, uh, uh, housing element, um, uh, what I'll be covering today is just a little brief background on our um, housing element and how it relates to the general plan. You heard a little bit about that in today's uh, great um, intro by Bob. Um, talk about our housing element timeline and status and challenges uh, with a focus on uh, the regional housing needs allocation and our strategy to meeting the housing allocation for the next uh, eight year cycle. So the housing element, as Bob mentioned, it's one of uh, seven mandated elements uh, by the state. Um, it's important that uh, under state law that the housing element be integrated into the general plan and be internally uh, consistent with the general plan. That's a requirement of all uh, jurisdictions in the state. 
Uh, what's interesting is that, um, as uh, alluded to previously, um, the housing element is uh, required to be certified by the state of California. It's the one element that requires certification by a state agency. Uh, there's a little bit of flexibility on updates to general plan, um, but housing elements must be updated. We're on an eight-year cycle. Uh, so our, our uh, region, um, the Bay Area region's uh, elements are due to be certified by January of 2023. And there is a 120-day period. Uh, cities are, and counties are having trouble with that time frame, and that's kind of what, where we're at. I'll explain that in a moment. Um, but just a little bit about the Mill Valley General Plan. There's two overarching goals uh, that have been in, uh, in effect since 1989, protect and enhance the natural uh, beauty and small town character of Mill Valley and encourage continued diversity of housing, income levels and lifestyles in the community. These goals were originally adopted, as I said, in 89 and provide the overall framework uh, for policy making by the uh, various chapters or elements of the general plan. Um, so the housing element uh, must speak to those overarching goals and therein is somewhat of a challenge um, with uh, meeting our uh, housing allocation for this next cycle, uh, which I'll touch on in just a moment. Um, but like uh, Adam, uh, shared with the Court of Madera's um, uh, process. Uh, we too in Mill Valley, we started our process about a year ago and um, we're still at it. We've had four workshops with the community uh, from uh, November 21 through May of 2022 on a range of topics uh, that range from sites analysis, um, housing needs, uh, review of draft scenarios to meeting our housing allocation, housing policies and programs. Um, like Corte Madera, we had a very robust um, uh, outreach program. Uh, we had very good participation from the community, uh, our workshop participants. We had over 300 individuals participating. We had two online sur surveys that went out to over 1,100 individuals. Uh, 500 survey comments received uh, comment letters from over 25 uh, organizations, uh, four city council meeting updates. Um, so on and so forth. So, um, and that is expected under the, by HCD, the Housing Community Development Department uh, to gain certification is that you reach out extensively to the community. Uh, we also went out to the community, um, uh, to farmer's markets, Memorial Day uh, pancake breakfast, Mill Valley Juneteenth, and uh, to uh, talk about our housing element and uh, solicit input. So where we are is a draft housing element was published in uh, August. It's available on our website, and I'll share that information in a moment. And we're awaiting uh, comments from um, the Housing and Community Development uh, State of California, and they're due next week. So we're anxiously awaiting HCD's comments. Uh, uh, we will be expected to respond to their comments. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about process in a moment. Uh, let's see here. Well, it, it, the other part I, I want to talk about is our EIR for the housing element. Uh, we must examine the environmental effects from the additional housing. Uh, so we're preparing a subsequent EIR that addresses uh, implementation programs of the housing element. And we expect to have the EIR published here in the next few weeks uh, for public review. So a little bit about our housing element. Uh, you've heard about this today. Fortunately, it makes my presentation a little uh, easier to explain, but uh, just to touch on the various chapters, uh, there's four uh, uh, chapters, and then there's uh, multiple appendices that make up our housing element. So these slides, uh, this slide describes the chapters and associated public outreach for each chapter. Uh, for example, chapter one is our background overview of the housing element program. Chapter two is our housing needs assessment, including demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. And chapter three is the housing resources, our size inventory to accommodate our housing allocation. And then chapter four, our housing plan, which reflects the goals, policies, and programs and implementation program for the next housing cycle. And then to the right um, is a framework that, that kind of explains how the various uh, pieces, housing needs, resources, framework uh, fit into the programs that uh, are uh, implemented over the next uh, eight-year cycle. And so like Corte Madera, this is our uh, 
re how we uh, uh, allocate the 865 units received from uh, the state. Uh, that is our allocation for the next eight year cycle by income category. Uh, again, that's 865. And then we have four categories required by state law and, and then a plan how that uh, uh, housing will be satisfied. Uh, so as far as challenges, uh, I just want to touch on one area, given the limited time I have, and that is uh, the uh, constraints that we have in Mill Valley, like other marine jurisdictions, re regarding high fire severity zones. Uh, over 60% of our parcels, 6,500 parcels, are within a very high fire, uh, high fire severity zone. We have different zones, which very high, high, and uh, moderate. Uh, and this uh, outline depicts our city limits. So that's the number one constraint. How are we going to accomplish 865 units uh, with very little land? Uh, Mill Valley, as you know, is mostly built out. So uh, Mill Valley, like other Marin jurisdictions, appealed our regional housing needs number, and it was denied. But our appeal was on the basis primarily of lack of available land suitable for urban development or the conversion of residential development. So the appeal was denied. Um, and um, that then, in turn, we had to pivot quickly uh, to uh, uh, the challenging task of how are we going to accommodate RENA. So the first thing we did was we looked at vacant land, uh, how, how that number can be achieved through you know, various uh, uh, strategies. And one was underutilized commercial zone land already zoned uh, for either commercial mixed use development, lot splits via new state law, that's SB9, entitled projects, also known as pipeline projects, ADUs, and the city's uh, pending owned, uh, city owned site uh, for uh, affordable housing development. So uh, we had a shortfall initially of over 405 units. So that was really an insurmountable challenge for us. Uh, so how is that achieved? It's through, like uh, Court of Madera and at, as Adam explained, uh, we have to resort to rezoning. And so we are uh, setting out three uh, overlay zones. One is a small lot uh, overlay zone for sites that are less than a half acre. And those sites essentially meet our low, low income category of housing needs. And then we also have a opportunity sites zone and those are parcels larger than a half an acre or you know, contiguous with common ownership. And then we also are converting offices, allowing office conversions by right uh, without a condition use permit. And we're also relaxing development standards like parking, building height, uh, floor area ratio, all in an effort to um, meet our arena. So we've demonstrated just that. And this is our table that has that breakdown uh, to the left is, you know, by the various categories, whether it's an ADU, uh, city-owned sites, opportunity sites, so on and so forth, office conversions. And then we also factored in um, a, a buffer that is expected by the state. Uh, be happy to explain that, but I'm, I'm a little short on time here. So this is a map that uh, depicts the table. Uh, so the tabulated uh, breakdown is reflected geographically uh, via this map uh, that represents the vacant lots, uh, the single family lots that qualify for lots, but it's parcels half an acre or more, par parcels that can add units and sites that could provide for a second floor office conversion. So with that, um, I just want to uh, re reflect that uh, as, as, you, as you know, Mill Valley, the uh, strategy here is through infill development. and you may think, well, 865 is is a large number. Is that will that change the uh, the the makeup of Mill Valley? And and actually, uh, as a planner, I see more of a subtle um, framework of physical change to the community. Uh, you know, we looked at um, yeah, areas that actually represent the densities that we're expecting, and what maybe a fourplex uh, would say turn into a sixplex or an eightplex. Uh, uh, with with the relaxation of parking standards. So, and we have opportunities like, for example, along the Miller Avenue corridor for a, a more infill development, as you can see on this map um, in, in this area here. So uh, we do have uh, quite a bit of information on our website, uh, cityofmillvalley.org forward slash housing element uh, to learn more about our housing element and 
also to download our draft housing element, as well as information on the, uh, the various outreach program. So with that, uh, thank you very much. That was terrific, Pat. Thanks very much. Um, and finally, I'd like to introduce uh, Alicia Gudic. Uh, Alicia is a community development director for the city of San Rafael. She's been a professional planner for over 20 years of experience in public and private sector planning, environmental planning, and urban development. She's worked in Marin, Sonoma, and uh, both Marin and Sonoma counties. Um, her experience include, includes managing a wide range of complex development related to residential and commercial development. Um, Alicia, take it away. Great, thanks so much for the introduction, Bob, and thank you for um, inviting uh, me here tonight, today. Um, I will go ahead and get started on this. Alexis, can you, if you can get that going. Um, so we actually jumped into the um, housing element update last fall. Alexis, can you go to the next slide? Um, this was, you know, we started, we had just completed a comprehensive general plan update. So it was like, get it done and move on to the next thing. So it was pretty intense to have us kind of start a, a housing element right after just completing a pretty intense um, update. Um, but we did it anyway. We started by um, selecting a group. We, we convened that group initially in January of uh, this year. And from January through July, um, we held monthly meetings and received input, provided the group with, um, with information on our past housing element and some constraints to think about. There was some pretty robust input from the group. Um, and um, we also conducted different forms of community outreach, which included um, reaching out to um, advocacy groups, um, on, you know, kind of face-to-face, one-on-one, to receive in-depth um, input on housing needs. And that helped inform um, how we you know, drafted our, um, our plan. Um, we continue to hold community workshops um, through, uh, through August, September. And then we released our housing element in November 4th um, for a 30-day review. Uh, we had a planning commission meeting last night and plan on having a city council meeting on December 5th, and hopefully um, we'll be submitting the HCD draft shortly after that. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we, can, uh, we selected a working group and convened that group starting in January of this year. Um, the group consisted of community members that represent a pretty diverse range of interests, including housing and homeless advocacy, um, we had developers, tenants, and property owners. So it was a pretty wide range. We really wanted to receive um, input from a wide range of um, community members. The meeting feedback that we received um, was, again, as I mentioned, was very robust. We um, had pretty deep conversations about where we've been and we, where we want to go and what our housing needs are, um, not you know, for only certain members, but all for all members of our community. Um, again, that helped inform how we drafted the housing element. And it really allowed us to think about, think more deeply about what that housing element needed to look like. Um, next slide, please. So there were two, the entire housing element is very important, but there were two specific um, pieces of the housing element that I think stood out for me and for a lot of community members. And one of those was um, defining housing opportunity sites. Um, we had identified housing opportunity sites in the prior um, in the prior housing element, and we weren't very successful. We um, selected a number of sites. We had a number of development proposals, but they were not in, within the. I think we might have had a couple of sites, but they, you know the other sites were just you know remain untouched um, in terms of uh, uh, proposals for residential development. Um, like I said, we received a number of. Uh, development proposals, but they were not within those sites. So we actually received some great input from the working group and from community members about possibilities. And so we collected data to inform how we selected sites in this go round. We're hoping with that um, collection of that data that it, it will be more successful this, this time. There's a couple of few um, points that I wanted to make. Um, first, 
being defined as a housing opportunity site doesn't mean that the city is going to develop these sites. And it doesn't mean that if you own the site that there, it precludes you from developing that site for other uses. In fact, we have identified a buffer within our um, total number of units. We have a total of 3,220 units allocated to the city. And we've identified a buffer to help us kind of, you know, if a commercial property is, uh, is developed as commercial, um, we have a buffer that we can use for um, to compensate for that. Um, so the other thing I want to mention is that all of our zoning districts allow for residential development and all of our commercial districts allow for multifamily housing. So the city of Santa Fe had um, an easier time, not an easy time, but an easier time than other cities um, in terms of defining housing opportunity sites. Um, this actually is a map of downtown. Uh, we, like I mentioned earlier, we just went through a pretty a comprehensive general plan update and we had anticipated that we were going to get um, a pretty large allocation. And so we defined opportunities in the downtown near transit um, as potential opportunity sites. And many of our sites are within this area. Um, this downtown currently has no density limits. So the way we broke up the um, the RENA allocation for our jurisdiction is we have uh, 1,349 units um, designated for low income, 522 designated for moderate, and 1,349 designated for above moderate. Um, next slide. So at this time, I want to um, uh, invite Alexis Keptanian. She, um, you know, as I mentioned, we had a pretty robust uh, working group meeting and it involved a number of our teams. Um, Alexis, I want to invite Alexis to present the rest of this um, uh, presentation because she was really instrumental in getting this, um, our housing action plan organized, defining our goals and defining our policies and programs that will um, help us um, address our housing need. Alexis, do you mind coming on? Sure, thanks, Ali, and hi, everyone. Good to be with you. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about um, our housing action plan, which is in chapter six of the housing element draft, um, which is available at sanrafelhousing.org. And um, all of the components that Bob was describing earlier, the needs assessment, our analysis to affirmatively further fair housing, um, the constraints and resources, all of that, um, as well as community feedback, um, informed the development of the housing plan and the four goals, uh, which are to end homelessness, um, further fair housing, ensure habitability and maintenance, and expand housing choices. And each of these goals has uh, policies and programs uh, underneath it that are meant to move the city towards um, achievement of that goal. And so the first goal, ending homelessness, this, this was a goal, um, or it was a, in several programs in the 2015 housing element, but it was, um, we really felt it was important to elevate um, ending and preventing homelessness to a goal in this housing element in line with um, the San Rafael City Council's priorities. And the programs um, underneath this goal span um, support for people who are currently experiencing homelessness through adequate shelter and case management funding, um, and also uh, programs to prevent homelessness and prevent people from becoming homeless um, in the first place. So things like providing relocation assistance in cases of no fault evictions. Um, and, and one of the uh, key aspects of this program that, that you'll see if you take a look at chapter six is um, that we, we plan to bring housing and homelessness um, together under one division in community development. Um, historically, homelessness has sat in the city manager's office and um, they are such interrelated issues that um, I think bringing them together will really be able to form a team that's, that's able to address these issues more cohesively and with less silos. Um, our second goal, uh, fair housing. Um, one of our key aspects is to strengthen public information and engagement. And that's based on feedback we received um, from community members that a lot of folks are not aware of housing laws and resources. 
Um, we also received significant feedback around the need for additional tenant protections. Um, and so we've committed to evaluating, gathering input from stakeholders and, and determining um, appropriate measures uh, moving forward in 2023 and 2024. Um, our third goal, um, habitability and maintenance. This was also based on really significant feedback in our community workshops where um, tenants showed up and asked for more frequent inspections. And so through our housing inspection program, we'll be increasing um, or we're proposing to increase um, evaluations, um, inspections for properties that have um, more than one verified um, violation on the property. And finally, our housing choice goal. And this has a whole range of different goals or um, programs around removing barriers to construction, increasing opportunities for housing in high resource areas th through, for example, encouraging accessory dwelling units and through our inclusionary requirement, um, and also meeting the, uh, the needs of special needs populations. So housing options for older adults, for people with disabilities, um, and for large families, for example. Um, and so there's there's 44 programs in our current draft. We're currently accepting public comment, as Ali mentioned, um, through December 5th and, and beyond. And um, I'll just take a moment, if I can, um, to, to say, oh, 60 seconds left. OK, um, I'm going to go ahead and just wrap up. I just want to quickly say um, that if you'd like to comment on our draft, you can submit comments to uh, Barry Miller. Uh, you can go on SanRafaelHousing.org, and there's um, an opportunity there to present um, any comments that you have, um, and we'll greatly appreciate those. Um, Allie, is there anything else you want to add before we wrap, close out and hand it back to Bob? No, that's it. Thank you so much for allowing us to present this. Thank you. Well, thank you, guys. These presentations have been wonderful. Um, so a couple of questions. Um, maybe I'll uh, hit you up first, Adam. Um, what surprised you so far? Let me, uh, I'll go back to my video here. Well, thanks, Bob. Um, uh, that's, that's a good one. You know, I think I've been surprised, I think, a little bit about um, the receptivity that we've gotten um, to, uh, I can tell you the environment uh, eight and a half years ago when I started working as planning and building director, and it was uh, at the time that we all know that the the Tam Ridge project or the Wind Cup development was 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 being constructed, and so there was definitely a um, a, a a large contingent of our community that was sort of very uh, didn't like to see uh, that development happening, concerned about multifamily housing, and so this process and and part of our work even coming up to the housing element was about laying the groundwork, analyzing how that project actually did not impact traffic uh, or parking, and then communicating that to our community. But we've had a lot of receptivity to actually, you know, modestly sized uh, redevelopment of our aging commercial properties. And so I, I would say that's been a pleasant surprise. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, I, I would just I would just start there. It's it, we've had good feedback that we're on the right track and that these are consistent with the town's goals, without trying to really um, uh, get into all the the housing mandates. Um, that's still there and present. Um, but I I think um, a lot of our community members have given us positive feedback in terms of like this is the right direction. So. Uh Thank you, Adam. Um, Patrick, um, how about you? Um, what surprised you in the process? Well, similar to the Corte Madera uh, sort of story, um, uh, we were pleasantly pleased with the level of support received with uh, our zoning program and the whole notion of uh, increasing density, for example. And I didn't go into that level of detail in my presentation, but just to give some context, our current densities are up to 29 to the acre, and we would be going up to 40 to the acre. Uh, 
for these overlay zones and then relaxing our parking standards as well as increasing building heights from 35 feet to 40 feet. Uh, what's interesting through the countywide effort uh, with respect to the uh, objective design development standard, just completely separate effort, we mobilized a task force of developers, architects, you know, design professionals, uh, interested members in the community to talk about development standards. And, there, and that actually preceded our housing element. And there was interest uh, through that effort uh, to increase uh, densities and increase building heights. So that momentum was already underway, but to see broad-based support, generally speaking, um, I was I was uh, staff here and myself were pleased with that, and also support from our decision makers. Uh, we had to get clearance from our planning commission and city council, um, and like Adam explained, I think yeah, uh, five ten years ago, I don't think there would have been that kind of level of support. I think things have changed quite a bit in the last five years. Um, I was pleased to hit through that 400 unit plus a shortfall. Um, and not that I was surprised, it was just a major undertaking uh, to, to accomplish that. So somewhat outside of your question, but uh, that was a major hurdle, um, but also to see the, the support from the community um, on the rezoning program. Uh, thanks, Patrick. Um, Ali, uh, shifting to you, um... How do you respond to the public concerns about traffic, water, environmental issues like wildfires and sea level rise? I'm sure you're hearing about that in the process. Yes, that's a really great question. Um, you know, we just went through, as I mentioned, a comprehensive general plan update, and there was a lot of um, studies that were done to to process that that um, that update and evaluate that update. So, you know, some of the, the topics that have come up, I mean, we haven't really received a, a ton of input on related to um, our housing element, but we, we know that that's a conversation that's out there, you know, our wildfires, uh, traffic, water availability has, be, has been an issue for some time. And, um, but, you know, we're in a housing crisis. And so housing is also an area that needs to be addressed. Um, and we are, to some extent, there are some limitations that um, that that we're tied to as a local jurisdiction, and, and um, we are obligated to accommodate our um, arena allocation. As I mentioned earlier, we have all of our zoning districts allow for residential development, and our commercial districts allow for multifamily development. So much of what we've been much of what's already there is already zoned and already has a land use designation to allow for residential and multifamily development. Not that we wouldn't evaluate these um, projects. You know, if, if we receive an application, we would be evaluating each, each project for its merit and, and its impact. Yeah. Bob, if, I could, if you don't mind, I, I'd like to respond yeah, to that one as well, just because I think, as Ali said, in talking about really comprehensive planning. I think that's really critical. And, and I think sometimes the we hear from people concerned about that and they think, well, you can't do housing if you don't address this. And it's sort of, I, my response is always like, it's not either or, we have to do both. You know, we, ha we definitely have to address the traffic, the water and um, sea level, Corte Madera, I mean, Corte Madera, all our sites are already in the floodplain. So sea level rise is a big issue, but we're, we've started the planning processes on climate adaptation as well as Santa Fel. And I know Patrick is doing the same thing. So it's, these things have to be done um, in parallel and it's gotta be done consistently and, and continue on over the, the next several decades as, growth happens. And so it's just making sure that we're together, all of us are doing this because it's not also anything that any one of our cities individually can can really resolve. I think we all are working to accomplish those on a more regional effort, uh, region-wide basis. So, uh, you know, I, I, those are valid, certainly valid concerns, but it's, it's um, you know, we just need to continue to push for a comprehensive planning in that regard and, and coordinated planning amongst all, all of our jurisdictions. Great point. And, and Patrick, I see Patrick nodding um, his head in agreement. Um, 
Scott, we're slightly over, but I'd like to ask one more question. Is that okay? Absolutely. Go ahead, Bob. Okay. Um, the in some ways the the newest um, maybe to me. Um, most interesting wrinkle in the housing element is the requirement to affirmatively further fair housing. Um, I've read um, uh, Mill Valley and um, Quarter Madeira in detail and just getting started on um, Allie's good work. Uh, but what I noticed from both of them is your analysis was very direct on segregation issues um, and uh, documented segregation, said it's there um, and uh, laid out policies to respond. Um, are you getting um, comment from the public on that? And I'd have to say, I, I found it really heartening in both in both documents. Patrick? Actually, uh, uh, the organization here in Mill Valley, uh, MV Free, uh, did review our AFFH uh, chapter and provided you know very uh, insightful comments, very valuable input that actually helped uh, build that program. I would say um, credit, you know, is due to the MB Free um, in helping us actually because it is a state mandate now, and um, it is a relatively new area for planners. Uh, it's the first one, uh, first housing element with that uh, requirement. So, other than MB Free, um, I can't think of any other specific um, individuals or organizations that did offer comment on it. We await um, uh, the states. Uh, response. Uh, what we're seeing uh, elsewhere in the region are um, requirements from the state, you know, their comment letters for a more robust uh, effort, but it's a bit of a, I see one of the questions about, well, how are we going to pay for these costs? Uh, we do, in a parallel um, sort of a reflection here, uh, is on the regional coordination in Marin, which is invaluable. We uh, three of us here uh, representing three agencies um, do collaborate with our uh, 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 colleagues uh, with other jurisdictions and the county um, monthly. Uh, it's called the Housing Working Group. Um, they've been an invaluable resource uh, for the, the region, and we expect you know, continued um, collaboration with, with the county um, on implementation of our housing element, in particular the AFFH uh, pro programs that are contained in that chapter. So uh, I, yeah, I'm not sure if my colleagues have anything to add to that, but uh, we're all in the same sort of bait boat in that regard. Uh, thanks, Patrick. Uh, Allie, um, your housing element, I've read the beginning, the goals, um, it's very direct on um, equity issues. Um, care to comment? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mentioned earlier that we started out the housing element just wanting to do this differently than we've done in the past. And um, the the way we selected the um, the group was very intentional. We really thought about what, you know, who do we want to um, include and which voices have not been participating in the past. And so it really helped. Um, with the conversations during the working groups meetings. And, um, you know, both Adam and Patrick mentioned the fact that we have been collaborating with the county early on. We had um, uh, Liz Darby and uh, other folks from the county show up at our council meetings and really lay out the groundwork for the need to really be, you know, bold about this housing element and the need to kind of think about it differently than we have in the past um, by, you know, you know, identifying past patterns of segregation and um, looking for, you know, um, sharing with the jurisdictions opportunities for um, collaborating on addressing, um, addressing this, in, the impact this has had on um, my, certain minority groups. So yeah, that, I don't, Think I have anything else? <laughs> That's good. That's good. Adam, uh, final words of wisdom, maybe on affirmatively furthering fair housing, and then we'll turn it over to Scott. Yeah. No, I, I think I think both Allie and Patrick covered it. I mean, I agree that um, the county's been instrumental um, with bringing resources and um, 
bringing just recognition of some of the historical issues in Marin with respect, especially to housing and, and some of the, for example, the deed restrictions and that were in place, uh, uh, not allowing um, purchase by African-Americans and in the past in certain subdivisions. Uh, I don't think a lot of people in our community really recognize and they actually, once that was communicated, I knew at a council meeting, so several residents went back and looked at their deeds and they sure enough, they found some of these covenants in there in the county having programs to actually, um, I don't think it's deleting it, but there's programs to actually address that in their deeds if they so so desire. Um, and, and so um, that was a big part of it. Um, we also felt compelled this in, in to reach out to different groups and in our community, um, uh, also beyond our community, um, having meetings with the Canal Alliance and, and uh, others um, that uh, also are, are part of uh, uh, communities of representing uh, underrepresented groups. And so it, it's, been a, it's been a good process, I think, just bringing in other voices than traditionally have been um, part of this process in the past. Uh, Patrick, Adam, Ali, I think we're winding up uh, this portion of the presentation on a positive note and we'll turn it back to Scott. Thank, Thank you much. Uh, excellent presentations, very informative and succinct. I, I apologize that we had the time limits that we did, but we did wanna reserve some time for the questions that I'm gonna try to run through now. I'll get through as many of these as I can. Uh, and you might have seen these coming in uh, as well in the Q&A. So I'm going to combine a couple of questions here, one from one of our viewers and another from uh, Grace Garrity, who's also watching. I'll just read them both. One says, uh, I'm wondering, are property owners being worked with on these developments uh, in Corte Madera or other towns, uh, or are they being offered to be bought out? Uh, and then another related question, I think, uh, many of the properties on the opportunity site lists are not for development or for sale currently by the owners. So has uh, uh, any of the cities, have any of the cities uh, been uh, doing anything to help motivate the owners to sell or to develop? And I guess this would be a question for anybody. Yeah, I could, I could start on that. And, and yes, I think, um... We've been in touch, I think, with we had 10 sites um, or 11 sites originally in Corte Madera that we were looking to you know, facilitate housing on. And, and at least eight or nine of them we were in direct contact with through the process. Uh, and um, several of them were already known to the town because they were sort of inquiring about potential development opportunities several years ago or they're sitting vacant and they had previous development proposals. So these are these are real. I, I would say in and more significantly, the I think this process has helped some of our property owners, specifically uh um I think the the Macy's ownership group, which is obviously a national organization, sort of start thinking about potential options moving forward and and uh for that property. So um I would say, yeah, broadly, yes, this is done in coordination with property owners, at least in, you know, in Corte Madera. Um, we have a smaller number of sites, so it may be different in other jurisdictions, um, how they're handling it, but um, we are in constant contact with them, yeah. Yeah, I, I can add, we, um, <clears throat> I wanted to clarify too that, um, you know, identifying a site isn't like we're not buying, we're not developing the site. The cities are not developers. Um, we and I also mentioned that we we didn't get it right last time, so we did a little bit more. <laughs> we out, we reached out to developers. We reached out to property owners. We actually received impact and requests from property owners um, to classify their site as a housing opportunity site. Um, in cases where it made sense, we we added it. In cases where they didn't make sense. Um, we just kind of are holding holding back until we actually absolutely need additional sites. But um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the other thing that the challenge is, you know, in terms of furthering fair housing, we had to look at places where, you know, we weren't looking at housing before. Um, the state has identified areas that are high resource areas, and that means that services and um, transit are available, schools are, better schools are available. And so we were, um, you know, really needing to look broadly at our city. And um, sometimes that means that 
Um, we were able to say yes to a developer that's interesting in a particular site. Sometimes we weren't um, because we really needed to balance um, which sites we were looking at um, and making sure that we were um, finding opportunities for um, improving uh, opportunities for housing in certain areas. So. Patrick, I don't know if there's anything you want to add. The other thing I wanted to add, I think uh, just that we set out initially to uh, consider the Safeway Shopping Center and the Whole Foods uh, Center, uh, seeing that they are potential infill development sites. Um, and the response was negative. So we, um, knowing that HCD will not, seeing a, um, essentially the uh, state um, expects um, assurances that there will be reasonable um, expectations that these sites can accommodate housing. So it's not just an exercise of, you know, color on the map. It's actually a realistic um, expectation that, you know, uh, as Ali mentioned, you know, these are zone sites, but that uh, uh, can accommodate infill development, um, redevelopment. So um, seeing that there was, you know, no interest uh, by these two uh, shopping center owners, uh, we uh, did not consider uh, those two sites in our sites inventory. So I just wanted to add that. But yes, we did uh, send letters to all um, uh, the opportunity sites um, and owners and uh, saying, you know, the objective was interest. And if there was no interest then um, or negative response, we, we adjusted accordingly on our sites inventory. So let, let me move to some questions that I think are related to um, what we've just been discussing. And we have one here from Todd Moody who asks, uh, he says, it, it seems almost impossible to provide such large numbers of low income housing without substantial subsidy. I don't see that our community or the state would provide support. What happens when we do not provide such housing? Uh, and, and it gets to the larger question. I mean, these, these RENA numbers are numbers. And uh, does that translate into uh, permits that are uh, uh, granted if applied for? And do those permits translate into units that are actually built? So obviously you've got this objective number and then the number that actually are built. And from what history has shown, uh, the arena targets are rarely achieved. So uh, I, I'd be curious if anyone has uh, comments about those issues. Yeah, Scott, I'll start. Um, that has been one of our challenges. We have, um, in our past cycle, um, we entitled almost the entire um, allocation, but we only received applications for building permits and issued building permits for half of those um, units. So it's, it's a challenge. And one of the challenges is funding. Um, the state has, um, funding opportunities. Um, we have, you know, through modifications to our zoning ordinance have developed, um, started to kind of um, increase the funding amounts that are in our affordable housing trust fund. So it provides opportunities for funding there. Um, and there are a number of other um, nonprofit um, entities that provide funding sources for um, affordable housing developers. So there's there's opportunity there, um, but but you're very right. We can identify the full three thousand two hundred and twenty units, um, but you know, you know, actually have actually seen development is is has always been a challenge for us. So we'll see we'll see what happens. Yeah, I, and that's the say. I don't think there's. Um that just speaks to you know a lot of this is out of our controls we can set the regulations identify sites all we want but there's many other factors that have to align in order for the actual housing to be constructed yeah and, and to Ali's point you, you can even get permitted but then there's actually building it so um I don't know I could speak for Corte Madera. I I think we're very eyes wide open that we're not going to keep up with and see this amount of development, it would be very unlikely to see this amount of development over the next eight years. Even the arena numbers say it's uh, 725, but it would be highly unlikely given the history to, that we actually achieve that just because of all the other factors that contribute to development of housing. Um, and so if we don't, you know, uh, 
let's say we don't meet that requirement, it, it basically, which we're already expecting at some point during the next cycle, most of us will be subject to certain laws that will allow for easier processing of building permits. Essentially, I think state laws kick in that, um, I mean, there's the real impact of actually not getting the housing we need, but there's also state laws that kick in to make housing approval processes uh, more streamlined and less discretionary in, in nature. Um, so there's, that's just, I guess the, sort of direct impact of not keeping up with the, the from a legal standpoint, but also obviously um, there's other impacts as well. If I could say something on that, the, the um, you know, it, I, I think the comment, the, the questioner is right. I mean, if the state, if the state wants the housing, they're going to have to help finance it, especially, and I'm here, I'm speaking of affordable housing. Um, you know, and we're going in, we're in, uh, people will debate whether or not we're in a recession or if we're going to wind up in a recession, but but certainly current economic conditions are uh, a real hindrance to um, housing development. Um, one of the trends you're starting to see in a few places is as the market rate um, builders can't afford to build, um, they're selling the profit, their properties off to nonprofit builders who have other funding sources. Um, it's going to be interesting to see whether any of that plays out in Marin County over the next few years. I, I I have heard from some developers that some of the tax credit projects, there's more um, leverage to actually build in high resource areas these days than there has been in the past. So that may help places like Marin actually get some more affordable housing, but that remains to be seen. Yeah. Let me, let me uh, jump into a couple of follow-ups that um we have from uh, Linda Jackson and some other listeners here. Uh, and I don't know if anybody's gonna buy it on this or not, but uh, with uh, using a crystal ball, do you have any idea how much new housing we can look forward to being built in the next year or two <laughs> or even beyond? Uh, another question, uh, when would these actually be due to be built? And then let me add a third on, uh, following up a little bit on Adam, what you were saying, uh, what if any of our cities and the county do not meet their their arena numbers? Uh, what are the consequences that uh, that we might unfortunately have to face? Well, um, I'll jump in. I uh, would say that uh, our saving grace uh, for this fifth housing cycle has has been ADUs, accessory dwelling units, and we'll continue to see ADUs, I believe. Uh, we're seeing ADUs um, with almost every um, either major renovation of an ADU, uh, they usually come with an ADU, or uh, certainly a new uh, single family residential. Um, they're far and few between because we don't have a lot of vacant sites. Occasionally there's a tear down and rebuild, and usually the rebuild comes with an ADU. We're averaging around 20 ADUs a year. And uh, that's been the case the last three years. Excuse me, so, Patrick. So just, just for those who aren't familiar with the acronym ADU, you might want to explain. Accessory dwelling unit. Um, and the state has actually um, uh, relaxed the requirements. And we have another round of new laws this year that we'll have to be implementing here in 2023, um, changing our ordinances. Uh, uh, essentially, there's some ADUs that are by right. So it's considered, you know, building permit only, straight um, ministerial review uh, versus previously discretionary review subject to planning commission or some sort of design review. So the state has uh, implemented uh, legislation to streamline ADUs and we've seen here in Mill Valley, I would assume that's the case in other jurisdiction an uptick in ADUs. So we'll continue to see ADUs there. As you saw in the pie chart, you know, a definite element to meeting arena. Um, I don't see a significant uh, sort of in terms of, well, let me back up, uh, affordable housing will be achieved through um, infill development. Um, we have the one, you probably heard about it, one Hamilton, it's 40 units assumed in our uh, housing element. Uh, uh, and we also have a housing trust fund, like uh, Elise um, alluded to in uh, court, um, uh, San Rafael. So we do have some funding uh, to work with uh, and to help facilitate um, housing. Um, and uh, we also have density bonus uh, requirements that allow increase in density that allows for concessions and waivers uh, from development regulations. So there are other tools uh, besides just you know our sites inventory 
Um, but I touched on accessory dwelling units because we are definitely we seeing those every year and we'll continue, I, I believe, uh, continue to see um, ADUs as well. Any other thoughts on uh, what the crystal ball shows for your jurisdiction? Okay, uh, let, let me move on. We've got a couple more minutes. I'll try and squeeze in a couple other questions here. Uh, David Smith asks, uh, I'm interested in the objective standards requirement and how cities can mesh that with the city's or the residents' desires to maintain the character of existing neighborhoods. Can someone clarify what aspects of new housing design and construction are controlled by objective standards? Also, are the objective standards statewide or individual to each city? Thank you for that, David. Anybody? Yeah. I can try to address that. Um, uh, so we, you know, I think we're we may be at various different points in the process of implementing objective standards for multifamily housing. That we did work collaboratively with several jurisdictions or many jurisdictions in the county on on developing standards. Um, the um, you know, so so there's a lot of, I mean, you can put as many standards into a zoning ordinance um, uh, that that you want to basically make a prescriptive building code um, or, or basically a form um, and requirements for new development. Um, the challenge though, and this is what I think, I think it's really important to recognize that um, with the density bonus laws um, and some other legislation that developers can take advantage of, um, the, there are standards that can be waived and uh, can be uh, must be modified essentially for projects that include a certain amount of affordable housing. So it starts to become challenging as planners. This is on one of my, the, my last slide is a challenge. I feel like it's hard because we wanna give certainty to our community about what sorts of buildings they're gonna get with these changes to the zoning and what type of housing they can expect. But the reality is um, we can't give that certainty um, all the time. And we, we can try and say, you know, and, and really, try to get developers to abide by our um, objective standards, uh, essentially, but it's not always uh, possible to um, uh, uh, have them adhere to those because of other state laws that they can take advantage of. I don't know if, Ali, if, if you or Patrick have other thoughts on that, but that's, I always get a little bit of heartburn. I, you know, you have to have the caveat when you show like a you know, 30 units an acre, you can get like a full, here we have a height limit of 45 feet or whatever it is and that, but at the end of the day, I think um, I always end up giving a caveat to our, whoever I'm talking to and saying like, look, it, it may not end up being exactly that height. Yeah, I we have actually in Santa Fe a couple of examples of that where we have in the downtown identified objective standards um, that were really intended on you know, aligning the downtown character. And um, we received applications for SB 35 and density bonus. And with those two applications combined, we like all the objective standards have, you know, gone out the window because you can request a height bonus. You can request deviations from architectural requirements. You can request deviations from uh, materials and colors and pretty much anything if you can say it's going to um, it's going to, you know, reduce the cost of the project of providing the affordable units. So it's tricky. Like we've tried to do, um, you know, what we think is the right thing. And, um, we, you know, haven't seen development yet, so we'll see what the end result will be. So, um, but yeah, it's tricky. All right, I'm gonna uh, I, I'm gonna take us over a little bit. I apologize for those who we didn't get the questions in, but I do want to ask one last question, and maybe we'll go over a little bit. But we started a little late, so I hope you all indulge me. Uh, so Susan Kirsch asks, people are saying that the arena process has morphed from a planning effort to a production schedule that works like a hammer. 
Some suggest that the current transfer of decision-making from locally elected officials to developers sets a dangerous precedent. Do any of you share that concern? And we'll wrap it up when you're finished addressing that. Um, well, um, maybe I'll uh, start. Um, uh, we um, are learning as we go and uh, this whole housing endeavor. Um, and we feel like, I would say over the years that the state um, is certainly flexing their muscles with respect to um, taking away local control. Um, and the whole notion of, uh, I think we one of the questions and Adam did you know, touch on this about um, what happens if we don't meet our housing targets and it becomes uh, essentially um, ministerial process. Um, so beyond just objective standards, uh, what we're seeing is, is that, um, yes, we, we zone to accommodate, but we don't build as the lead I mentioned. Um, and so it's the market uh, responds. That's the frustrating part of this exercise, but also just with uh, ADU law um, and where we are with our housing law in general, um, it, as a planner working over 35 years, uh, seeing more local control um, stripped away um, uh, is is concerning um, and as a planner. And I know the community is concerned about that as well. Um, there is some level of frustration here with our level of authority. Um, and I think Bob mentioned at the beginning of the presentation about his experience as a planner uh, regarding what used to be, you know, subjective standards, I mean, and no longer applying, having the ability for a housing development project to apply um, context sensitive design guidelines uh, under the law. So um, we'll see how this evolves. Um, I, uh, that's just a perspective that um, is somewhat just reflecting on on my limited experience because this is somewhat limited in terms of how this is evolving so um yeah i would, I would oh, go ahead ellie sorry i was i just i'm gonna have to go so i'm gonna jump in next real quick um so we're in a housing crisis so i'm not sure about you know elected officials and how that impacts you know the politics around the requirements around the housing element but we are in a housing crisis that's real um, my personal experience with this housing element update has been um, pretty intense. You, you know, discussing, you know, having conversations with people that are truly impacted, that can't afford housing, that in some, in some cases are having to relocate because developers or property owners, large property owners are purchasing apartment buildings and requiring relocation of some of these tenants. And so it's a reality. And um, I, yeah, it's, there's an urgency. We're, we're like eight years is not a lot of time to develop 3,220 units. Um, but we need to, we need to find a way. And, you know, like I said, it's it, that we, we struggled, we struggled last time with the thousand units that were allocated to us. Um, and yet the need is there. And so somehow we need to figure out how we're going to help developers see development through once they're entitled. Um, you know, as far as, you know, how the politics um, impact it, like, I, I don't, I don't think I can respond to that. I just know that we are in a housing crisis and we need housing. If I could, if I could say something, I mean, I think if, I think if lo local communities want to uh, um, have control, they have to take control. Um, and I would argue for um, a solid um, design standards, uh, objective design standards that do address the SB 35 problem. Uh, under SB 35, uh, for example, a project can get um, a height bonus that wasn't anticipated in the zoning ordinance. Well, um, adopt a, a design, a measurable um, objective design standard that deals with that. Um, what I would say is it's early days. Um, and that um, it's it's going to take some uh, research and innovation uh, to find new ways to um, control, uh, but nevertheless um, allow for make room 
uh, for the incentives um, and the goals that the uh, state has set, because um, we are in a housing crisis. Um, and, and all three of the housing elements identified on, on this panel today um, have identified that and um, talked about the effects it has on families, um, how it tends to segregate families, how it leaves them um, overpaying so that they have time, they have trouble with the groceries and the kids' clothes and stuff like that. Um, so I think if you're going to um, main, con maintain control, you're going to have to innovate to take control. Any last thoughts, Adam? No, I, I mean, I think um, real quickly, I, uh, there's also, I think, uh, opportunity. I would like to see certain, um, when we say developers, there's market rate developers, is there nonprofit housing developers? There's other, um, there's a range of people who can build housing. Maybe there's innovation on that end too that we can start to think mm -hmm. of and, and how to really build um, the type of housing that the community wants to see through some innovation there. Um, Financing is a big part of that. So, and I and I would also say in Quarter Madera, like I, one of the strategies was, you know, development. Some of these properties that we're looking at, they're not doing anything for the town right now. And so, development can be very good um, and provide a lot of new um, uh, services, uh, activation, um, and and really improve the overall quality of the town as well. So it's not. Uh, I, it, it does. You know, we try to. I think we're fortunate in Marin. I think we're likely to bring in good developer development because there is money to be made here as well, too, from the private side. All right. I'm going to have to wrap it up there. I wish I didn't. We could have gone on longer. And I, first of all, I want to thank our presenters for excellent presentations, very authoritative. So uh, thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you, Alicia and uh, Ali. I'm sorry, uh, Alexis, was that her? She's already gone, so we'll thank her as well. And Bob, thank you for being our MC today and doing a masterful job. Last, I want to thank our webmaster, Alan Shavitz, who runs everything behind the scenes so masterfully, and our program chair, Kevin Haggerty, for putting this program together. Uh, as mentioned, this will be uh, on our website as a recorded program, probably within the next 24, 48 hours. And lastly, just remind you, our December 14 event at noon, uh, Stephanie Moulton Peters uh, will be presenting, and you can register for that on our website shortly. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, apologies for being so hurried here, but uh, we had a lot to cover, and I thought this was a great program, and I thank you all for being a part of it, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks very much. <laughs>